Pull up. Pull up. What's up, YouTube? Welcome back to Hangar Zilch79. I am Zilch. Yet again, I haven't changed much. Just a heads up, this may be my last YouTube video for quite some time because I'm moving. I'll get to that later. Don't worry about it. But, um, been kind of inspired by some online discussion, kind of comparing and contrasting the uh, DCS Spitfire Mark 9 and the uh, DCS new Falk Wolf 190AH model. Very interesting discussion. And I want to, you know, I love all the World War II aircraft in DCS, but I kind of want to. I chose these two for a reason because I think they really highlight what DCS has to offer, and they also are an interesting kind of design comparison. So uh, I'm by no means an expert on either one of these aircraft, but just like every other jerk on YouTube with a microphone and video capture software, I know just enough to fake it for a few minutes. So. Bear with me for a bit. I want to talk about the design a little bit, uh, kind of go over some stats, kind of compare them a little bit. But then my point here is that if you're trying to branch into DCS World War II, uh, kind of trying to figure out where your abilities and tastes may lie and what, why DCS is special versus other simulators, uh, this may answer a few of those questions. Uh, maybe it might be useful to you. I don't know. I hope so. So what I'm not going to do is dogfight one-on-one -on -one against the AI again because that gets, well, that highlights some of DCS's weak points. The damage modeling, yes, the AI behavior, yes, they know this, they're working on it. So um, I don't think that really showcases the best of DCS by doing that. Uh, you'll notice how easily, maybe in my previous video, it was like pretty much a piece of cake for me to shoot down the F-16 using the F-18. And it turned out to be not so much of a showcase of the Hornet's abilities or mine by a log shot, but then it just kind of that the AI tends to be pretty predictable. And if you know it's game, you can you can pretty well beat it most of the time. So let's compare these two contemporary aircraft that are very different from one another. So we're going to get into the different uh, design concepts between the two aircraft, but they, they are contemporaries, and you have to kind of put them in context, right? So you got uh, you know the Allies and the Axis powers duking it out for you know, whatever, but to rehash the World War II thing. There's more than enough material out there to, for you to enjoy at the mere cost of millions of lives. Sorry, I don't mean to get too serious on you too quickly without warning you. I, I do want to address that topic maybe at a later date. I think that's a serious discussion maybe for another time. But for now, let's get back into the aircraft, right? So if you look at, uh, let's say, late, uh, even mid to late 1930s fighter design uh, across various countries, most of the time you're going to find things represented Representatives include, let's say, the, the Spitfire, early March Spitfire, even late ones, uh, the Hurricane, the, the P-40, uh, the P-51, uh, the, the, the BF-109. If you look at these, they all have kind of a similar shape and form, and they have inline engines. Idea being that the, 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 the thought was that if you want something that performs really well, you want minimal resistance up front, minimal frontal area, and the most powerful engine you can find, and that using a radial engine, all the, for all its advantages, has a lot of frontal area. And if you make the thing fat up front, you're going to have to use some engineering to make the thing trim down toward the back. So even though you can kind of streamline the design around a radial engine, it's still going to have that fat nose. And it was kind of poo-pooed. Huh, I said poo-poo. That said, a lot of successful fighters use radial engines. The Zero, the Wildcat, the P-47, the Corsair. Uh, but in a lot of these, you know, a lot of these uh, other fighters, contemporaries, uh, they're overriding factors, right? So if you have a naval fighter like the Zero, like the Wildcat, um, you want something simple and reliable because you're going to be operating over water, right? You want fewer components, fewer points of failure. So if you have a radiator and the potential for leakage, especially if you're going to be slamming that thing into a carrier deck, that's more wear and tear. That's just another thing to break. So you want reliability over the ocean. Radial engine with its simple air-cooled concept makes a ton of sense. But for a land-based fighter, land-based uh, interceptor, dogfighter, whatever you wanted, uh, a lot of the fighters back, you know, let's say late 1930s, like the Spitfire and the BF-109 were designed as kind of like a point interceptor, right? Uh, all about acceleration and agility and speed. So you, you, you get the most powerful engine, you can streamline it. So it's an inline engine, even with the radiator, with the added weight and complexity, they thought it was a good trade-off. And put the most sleek, streamlined, aerodynamic, thin frame around that engine as possible. In my opinion, this is uh, kind of what they called a thoroughbred design, something fast, something lean, uh, 
but not horribly robust. Um, Spitfire, Mustang, for all their merits, uh, you know, as solid as they may have been, were not as rugged as something with the radial engine. There's just uh, more, more points of failure, right? They're built for speed, not durability. Different design concept. Yeah, so if, I, if uh, my sources are correct, and if I infer the right thing from those sources, and I can't remember what they were because I've been reading this kind of stuff since I can remember, uh, it was kind of a bit of elitism. Like, okay, if you're going to build the best, highest performing fighter, the only way to do this is with an inline engine, because otherwise you sacrifice performance. Counter argument to that would be the Zero. That's a different story, though. I won't get into it. So, Germany is slugging it out, right? They're building aircraft with inline engines, uh, even their bombers. So you're looking at the, the BF-109, the, the, the ME-110, the HE-111, the JU-88. Uh, those all have uh, inline engines. Probably for aerodynamic reasons, I don't know, I'm just guessing. Meanwhile, BMW had developed this cool radial engine, which wasn't in high demand, but it could have been made available in large numbers. So Kurt Tank trying to make something to supplement the uh, limited production of the, the BF-109 started to design something that was completely different. Still a fighter, still fast, still agile, but utilizing the readily available radial engine produced by BMW. And I think his wording was something like, well, if the BF-109 and the Spitfire is a thoroughbred, I want to build a workhorse, or a warhorse, or something a little more solid, something more durable, something that can do work, something that's easy to use and easy to control. And to help work around the uh, frontal area problem inherent with the radial engine, he designed this streamlined cowling with a like, kind of a unique, like, close-fitting uh, kind of soda can look to it with a, a distinctive prop spinner. And uh, the result was the Focke Wolf Mode ID. And this is why I love DCS, because as opposed just to throwing a bunch of stats into a simulator and putting a different 3D model and, have, and leaving it alone, DCS is sophisticated enough to model these little idiosyncrasies and quirks and minute characteristics and flaws and personalities of all these aircraft. Unfortunately, I've never flown any of them in real life, but I understand people who have. Uh, see, DCS is about as close as you're going to get. So, with this in mind, we can hop into DCS and start flying these planes against AI targets, the same kind of AI targets, basically. To kind of, uh, I want to, I'm not going to fight one against the other, disclaimer. I'm not going to do that against the AI, because AI right now, uh, you know, I'm not going to do, oh, this plane beats that plane. What I want to do is fly against a formation of four AI targets flying in pretty much a straight line to show you what I mean when there's a big difference between these two planes. With that in mind, if you are looking to move into DCS World War II, whether you're new to DCS, new to flight simulators, or maybe you fly Flaming Cliffs 3 aircraft, or maybe you're flying the Warthog or the Hornet or whatever, you know, like, what's this World War II crap all about? How do I get started without getting too frustrated? And maybe what suits my taste a little better? You may want to tune down on this because it may affect your decision a little bit. I'm not saying one's better or one's worse. I'm saying they're different. You'll see why in a second. Spitfire Mark IX. There may be sexier machines in the world, but not many. Everything else aside, this has got to be one of the most beautiful machines I have ever seen in my entire life just doesn't get that better. It doesn't get much better than this. You have a concept of what a fighting aircraft is. It's powerful. It's fast. It's agile. It can do some damage. But it's also elegant. And the Spitfire embodies all of these traits. I just... Ugh, just It's gorgeous. It, let's go into the attributes of this. When you're going to be flying it in DCS, you'll notice that it gains speed pretty quickly it bleeds speed fairly quickly so uh, you may notice it climbs really well because it's got a high power to weight ratio uh, you know kind of a lower wing loading because the area of the wing is pretty big compared to its weight and uh, it turns on a dime uh, it's been said somewhere I don't know I've read so much crap I can't remember where I got it all but uh, the, the same was something like, oh, well, you need silk hands to fly a Spitfire. It's very, very touchy. And I think it's one of the most perfectly named machines. You know, something like uh, the Thunderbolt 2 ended up getting renamed the Warthog. You know, a lot of uh, 
lot of aircraft and machines in general, they have an official name and then something else that the users actually call them. Spitfire, I think, was just called the Spit. I think the Spitfire was a perfect name for it. It is a hot rod. It is temperamental. It is finicky. It is very, very touchy and will bite you in the ass if you do not handle it with the utmost finesse. This goes for handling it, aerobatics, takeoff, and especially landing with the narrow track landing gear. And most importantly to this video, trying to make shots count with the weapons and the gun sight provided. I'll get into that. Contrast to the Focke-Wulf 190A8. They don't look very much alike, do they? They both look like fighters. And you need to go in the, into the aesthetics a little bit, aside from the kind of artistic interpretation of what you think, how cool you think it looks. Uh, the design matters. Uh, they say if it looks good, it flies good, and there's a reason for that. Both of these look good, but my opinion, very different ways. This looks like a more sturdy, robust aircraft because it was. Does it look as sleek? Does it look as fast? Maybe. I don't know. It's open to opinion. But it looks sturdy because it is. This is a well-built, solid, yet surprisingly agile and fast fighter considering its large frontal area. Talked about that cowling earlier. Uh, if you look at it, the prop spinner fits pretty snugly into the cowling, and if you've ever uh, flown general aviation, done a pre-flight or anything, you kind of know how important that cowling is. It's not just to cover up the engine, it's there to direct airflow where it needs to be around the pistons to make sure everything gets nice and cool. Here, let's uh, let's look into this a little bit, zoom in on the, on the nose. You can see this prop spinner isn't just to streamline the aircraft, it also pushes the air in here, it runs it along the, uh, the fins on the pistons, a little, uh, you can even see them in there, onto the cylinders. They're kind of like a motorcycle engine, right? Um, so uh, it looks like that for a reason, kind of drifting off into space here. But uh, this thing still looks like it wants to kick your ass. Not nearly as temperamental as the Spitfire. In fact, this when you when you hop in this thing in DCS, it's just so pleasant. It uh, it just it's not going to kick you. It's not going to do anything surprising. It's going to do everything in a predictable fashion. You can take it off fairly easily, a little on the challenging side. Once you get used to the rudder, it's pretty okay. You can land it. It's got nice wide track landing gear. See the attachment points here and here. Um, you don't have to worry about the radiator. So what you lose in aerodynamics, you gain in simplicity and reliability. You have a throttle and you have a prop uh, RPM lever. And those actually are correlated with that, the device they have. I uh, forgot the name of it, which automatically controls propeller pitch for you, making things much easier which kind of goes into my point. Hop into the cockpit of this thing, everything is laid out so nicely, so easily, so intuitive. So minimizing training time, right? So something like the Spit, not quite as ergonomic. The cockpit in the 190 was pretty revolutionary. Everything's electronic, it's push buttons, blew everybody's mind. Uh, just, just very well thought out, very well laid out. And this stuff matters, right? So um, easy to use, easy to learn, no bad habits that I've discovered yet. And you can just kind of do what you want with a throttle. And that may be a bug in the in the game right now, but I haven't damaged the engine yet. At least not without it getting shot. And even if it does get shot, you can probably still make it back. Cool stuff. So let's see how they work when you try to shoot something with them. This is where I'm going with all of this. All right, so again, in this scenario, uh, my goal is to see how many of these four kind of dump drone aircraft I can shoot down with the full amount of ammunition provided. How quickly I can do it. Okay, so the agility of this, the Spitfire, the turn rate, which is godly demonstrated right here, right? So, my take on this after a few runs of this is that the Spitfire is one of the most agile things in DCS. You can just turn in like no space and no time. Whether it's a rate fight, radius fight, doesn't matter. You're gonna you're gonna get your bonus on the target. Now, the problem with that is, what do you do once you get there? So, I've been flying simulators for quite a while. I'm pretty okay at it, but this is damn difficult. Just trying to hold it still as a gun platform. This 
Spitfire is an extreme challenge, to put it lightly. You know, as a tactician, you know, if you have studied air combat maneuvers, if you've read Shaw's Bible, if you have practiced uh, BFM, you studied the dogfight at all, and you fly the Spitfire and you've studied it, and you know its capabilities and its limits, and you've got your joystick mapped out, and all that other stuff, and you're nice and cozy with it, you will have zero problem whatsoever getting onto the tail of whatever target you care to get. It may not be quite as fast as the Mustang or the Dora in a straight line, but you can catch them enough. get there. Was that a tail that fell off the tail? The problem is, for all its advantages, it's eye-watering performance. Your acceleration, your, your deceleration, your, your turn rate, your ability to just climb and hang on your prop. Look what I just did. Just absolutely effortless. The challenge then becomes fighter aircraft, when you get down to it, its whole idea is to put weapons where you want them to be, and unless you can do that accurately and reliably, uh, and utilize your resources well, then it's all for naught, right? So yeah, you can get on their tail, but what are you going to do then? Especially in a dogfight, when you have split seconds to make a shot, right? You, you can, when, if you're good at deflection shooting, that's great. Um, but you really have to have a lot of fine control over this gun sight. You see how it likes to oscillate? Um, it, like I said, silk hands shot. Um, now, I want to talk about ballistics a bit uh, while we're doing this here. I'm going to gloss over the subject. I guess I'm going to about it. Actually, that's a less than 5 degree angle off, right? So, I'm going to run pretty much on the beat. See if I can get it before he turns. That's about 5 degree angle off, so I'm right there. I'm having a hell of a time doing this. And this is an ideal shot. I'm on a 6, and he's not going over it. I'm in plane with him. I could make a kill anytime I care to, if I could just get this thing. It's kind of problematic. Now in a real dogfight, you don't have that much time to line up your shots, so my point is, if you have the time to practice with the Spitfire and get good at using his weapons, and uh, practice your deflection shooting, uh, watch the videos I'm going to link down in the comments, read back the hunt, get a good feel for what different angle off uh, silhouettes look like, where to put the plane on your gun sight to correspond to that angle off. I'll link some videos in the description for you to look into that. Because other people are better than I can. Um, oops. This is not kind of a... I like the strike effects. It's great. So if you get them dead to rights, um, you know, you can use the Red Baron technique like I am right now. Just basically put your... Pip Fill the gun sight with bad guy and squeeze the trigger. You can't miss. That's kind of the beginner's way to do it, but uh, as you progress and do actual dogfights, PvP, whatever you're going to do, even AI at higher difficulties, you're not going to get these kinds of shots. You're not going to be able to... He's not going to hold still enough for you to really do this. So you're going to have to get better at... I guess he had enough. So, you have to get better at... Uh, at a split second decision, let's kind of simulate it here, let's see, he's at about a 20 to 30 degree angle off, so I'm going to have to put him on the uh, the ring of the gun sight in, I'm going to have to put him in, okay, right, and make him, boom, shoot him right then. So, um, you don't have much time. Um, that said, you can get those opportunities probably more frequently in the Spitfire than you can with the 590, or even probably any other World War II fighter in DCS. You can just get where you want to be, it's almost effortless. It does take some coordination uh, with the rudder. It takes some, you know, you're going to have to make sure you don't overheat your radiator and all those other factors. But, you know, when flying this thing, you get the impression that it fits like a glove. Uh, it's cozy. It just wraps around you. And just the tiniest little flick of the wrist, it just, boom. It's it almost like it knows where you want to go and does it. Uh, that said, it's a little on the squirrely side. It's a little jumpy. The agility comes at the cost of stability and effectiveness as a gun platform. Look at these wings. They're super thin, right? In, uh, in the development of the Spitfire, there was actually a lot of concern that it was going to be able to hold enough weaponry. And with those weaponry, uh, sorry, with that weaponry mounted at the wings, was it going to be able to be employed in meaningful fashion with vibration, um, 
insurgents. <coughs> Excuse me, a massive fire and all that other stuff. Yeah, ballistics is a very complicated subject. Yeah, kind of a, an interest of mine. Um, so just imagine yourself at a shooting range with a rifle on a bench rest, trying to make that shot hit a grapefruit sized circle at 100 yards. It's a pretty complicated process, but uh, no. Put six such things firing at full auto, causing a ton of vibration in a firing platform that is not entirely stable, trying to, traveling at 200 plus miles per hour, while trying to shoot at another target that doesn't want to be shot traveling at 200 miles per hour, while evading shooting ahead of it so your bullets arrive at the point in space where your target does at the same time, while accounting for angle off, convergence, bullet drop, your lead angle, all that other stuff. And it's a wonder anybody was able to make any, any kills at all, short of just locking onto 76 and stuff to consider. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to throw some links uh, to some pretty cool videos that may help you out. They helped me out a ton after watching them. I, it, you know, that's where academic study actually helps. There's academic study and then there's practical you know, practice. Um, and you put these two together and you, you become more effective than you were yesterday. And it's a, this ongoing process, which is aviation. You may have it virtual. I will add that this session in particular I did pretty well. Um, most attempts at this same mission I was only able to shoot down maybe 2.5 Fock Wolves before I ran out of ammo. And here we are in the Anton. Already, right off the bat, I am struck with how damn stable this thing is. It's not even a challenge to hit to keep the target your gun sight on the aircraft. It, you could do surgery with this thing. It's that stable. You could pick which part of the airplane you want to shoot. I want to see if I can put that into practice here. As a gun platform, this thing definitely takes the cake. So, just by comparison, so instead of four machine guns and two cannon, you have four cannon and two machine guns. So right off the bat, you're 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 hitting harder. Uh, also, those two machine guns, instead of being 303, they're 13 millimeter. So those are roughly equivalent to uh, 50 caliber, about half an inch. So that's a lot of lead. You don't have to worry about convergence so much. You've got these uh, the cow mounted machine guns. And the, the two inboard cannon firing firing through the propeller arm, so don't have to worry about convergence at all. And the outboard ones, I uh, don't really know if those are set to converge or not, or if they're just shooting straight ahead. But no matter what, look at this. Now you did see it took longer for me to haul my nose around. I wasn't pulling as hard as I could have. But now that my nose is here, I can take my pick of which thing I want to shoot, and I can shoot it much where I want. Let's take the lead here. Looks like about, I don't know, five to ten degrees angle off. I'm gonna put the cannon. Let's see if I can uh, take a little out there. Boom. He's missing an aileron. easier to put the guns on target, and once you do, it shreds your target, and you've got, check this out, a ton more ammo. I've already shot one down, and I've got, sorry about this, first off, the ammo counter is really nice. Second, these wings are thicker, which has aerodynamic issues, but as a weapons platform, it's definitely preferable, right? I can hold a lot more ammo in this plane. It's just stable. It is rock solid. Here's the thing. In this plane, you don't have the performance of the Spitfire. So it's going to be a lot more difficult to get on the tail of the thing you're trying to kill. But once you do, it is way easier to actually make something of it. Look at this. I could stay here all day if I wanted to. Boom! I shredded both wings off that thing in one burst. It is the clipped wing variant. <laughs> Performance-wise, it's no slouch. 
It's no Spitfire, but... You know, am I gonna give a Mustang a hell of a hard time? Damn right. single time I've run this scenario against the Spitfire, I've shot down successfully all four aircraft without even running dry of cannon at all. Check this out. We have plenty left. Plenty. So, and check this out. Trim it up a little bit here. A little bit. Of, okay, so I'm going to kick in just a touch of yaw in my rudder. Make sure the elevator out. Look, my hand is off the stick. a little bit with the rudders. Yeah, I'm not trimmed properly, but you get the idea. This thing is a rock solid. So that and my roll rate's really good too. Big old ailerons. This thing just really good at reversing. So if you're in a dogfight, you get shot at defensively. If you want to spoil a shot, remember you want uh, for somebody to shoot you. Ideally, for him, he's going to want to be in the same plane of motion as you, rolling wings level with you. You can now roll it and pull some amount of G. Uh, you're not in the same plane of motion anymore. That's going to spoil his shot very effectively. So defensively, this plane has a lot going for it. Uh, you can roll, you can accelerate reasonably well, uh, but you're also solid. You can take a lot of hits, a lot more than the Spitfire, the Mustang, the Dora, the, the, uh, the 109. Uh, this place is pretty damn tough. It's just built to, you know, like a machine that's going to see combat. You know, it is a, it is a meat and potatoes, solid, easy to use, easy to fly, except for takeoff and maybe landing. Um, pretty much intuitive airplane. So if you're just starting out in DCS World War II stuff, and you don't want to get frustrated, and you want something that's pretty effective, and you want a pretty easy time shooting targets. I think the 190 might be a better choice. The cockpit is very well laid out. It's probably one of the best in any aircraft I've ever seen. It's just intuitive. It's easy to see. Everything's electronic. Push button controls, all that other stuff, which for the 1940s was insane. It's kind of the... It's been called the predecessor to the modern Motas. So, um, for anyone starting out, and you want to just fly and not worry too, too much. Um, if you just want to focus on your tactics and your gunnery, uh, this would probably be a little easier. The Spitfire, you're going to be frustrated immediately when you try to take off a lid. You're also going to be frustrated when you try to make shots. Assuming you, let's say you start in flight just to kind of focus on the dogfight itself, then you maneuver into the, you know, into firing position. You're like, okay, I got him. You're gonna have a hard time as a as a beginner, even as an intermediate, even advanced pilots, virtual pilots. That is, you're gonna have a hard time, I would imagine, getting that gun sight on the target long enough to get a good shot. I'm repeating myself a lot here, but uh, if you do manage to use the Focke-Wulf 98 8s, the Anton's attributes to outfly your opponent, you get to a good firing position. <laughs> he is freaking toast, no question learn how to use this gun sight. Remember, that ring is where you want your target to be if you're at about 20 degrees angle off. 10 degrees angle off, you want the target to be between the ring and the center. Maybe it's 5 degrees, maybe about 25% out. If you said 30 degrees, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's worth the edge of the glass there. Um, so, as I alluded to already, I think the Anton may be a better choice if you're just starting out in DCS uh, World War II. Um, in the, this comparison, I think, is a perfect example of how you cannot determine the outcome of a contest based merely on the stats. You can't even determine which is the better aircraft based on the stats. You can learn things about it, things that are very valuable, like acceleration, top speed, turn rate, thrust to weight ratio, armament, 
all that other good stuff. All kinds of goodies, avionics, gun sight, all that. It gives you a general picture of what the thing can do. But, there's always things that just aren't accounted for. Like, stability. Uh, you know, these things that make huge differences in a practical sense. There's a quote from U.S. Navy Commander Ron Bugs McKeown, who said something like, Beware of the lessons of a fighter pilot who would rather fly a slide rule than kick your ass. And this is a good illustration of that. It's like, yeah, you can compare the stats. Yeah, you can look at thrust to weight ratios, climb rate, and all that good stuff. But you really have to get in there and do the thing. You have to put it into practice. And if you can't do that, all the calculations and study and all that are all for naught. And if you can't harness the performance of whatever superior aircraft you're flying, that's not doing you any good either. It's kind of like a high-powered sports car with horrible tires on it that peel out any time you hit the gas. There's no point to having a 700 horsepower V10 if you can't control it and accelerate. Use it for something, you know what I mean? Uh, you can also uh, go back to, let's let's go to Korea, for example, right? You have a good comparison between the MiG-15 and the F-86 Sabre. Classic matchup. You, you can't find two more interestingly, evenly matched planes in history. I mean, they're, they're similar, even in, in, in aesthetics. They look similar. Uh, a few details here and there. It'd be hard for a layman to distinguish, you know, the, you know, the, the two. Um, you look at the MiG-15's got a better climb rate. Okay, well, the F-86 has a better roll rate. Okay, well, the MiG-15 has heavier armament. Okay, true, but the F-86 has the fancy radar-ranging A-4 gun sight. And you get, you go back and forth, and, and the, the consensus seems to be, well, in that contest, it's going to depend. They're so closely matched, despite a few differences here and there. It's all about who's flying it. Then there's things that they just don't account for if you just read about it, right? Like the ejection seat, for example. Um... MiG-15 had an explosive cartridge or something like that, which ended up killing, I think, pretty much everybody who ejected from it. Uh, the climate control system in the MiG-15 didn't really work so well. So if you're flying at 30,000 feet and it's freaking negative something, and you're freezing and you can't feel your toes, and you have to fight like that, you think that's going to be a little distracting. Look at the ergonomics. Is everything within easy reach? Is my mind focused on trying to interpret what my gauges are telling me, or trying to remember what switch is where when they all look the same on a circuit breaker panel, or is everything logically laid out, clear, easy to see at a glance because I don't have much time to go scoping around down in my cockpit. I need to keep my head up in the bubble and look outside. The F-86's cockpit is just phenomenally better than the MiG-15. Sorry, I'm express expressing some bit of a bias there, but it was designed with logic and ergonomics, whereas the MiG-15 had a different concept. It's like, hey, let's let's make this easy to build and easy to work on. Okay? So, so different concept. Uh, but from a pilot's perspective, the, the Sabre was better, more comfortable. And G-suits. Okay? So, you can pull more Gs without blacking out, even in a practical sense. So maybe the MiG-15 and the F-86 had similar turn performance, but if the MiG pilot was going to black out before the Sabre pilot Who's winning that? No contest, right? Um, less mental workload with the gun sight. Radar ranging, automatic. You didn't have to mess with the twist grip or anything like that. You just found the range, and you just put the paper on the target, squeeze the trigger, and boom, you've got yourself a big kill. So, a lot of this stuff we don't have to worry about in DCS. Um, I don't have to worry about climate control in my virtual MiG-15. I just go and, and set that you know, on my thermostat in the house. I don't have to worry about my G-suit. I haven't built a simulator cockpit uh, fancy enough to really simulate those effects, but, um, you know, your virtual DCS pilot is going to black out at pretty much the same rate. So so that doesn't matter. So in DCS, the two are much, much, much more evenly matched. Even the cockpit, I can bind those keys to my HOTAS. Let's say if I don't want to put my head down in the MiG-15 virtual cockpit, I can just bind the stuff I need to my comfy, cozy F-16 style HOTAS and be done with it. I don't have to worry about that stuff. So that now you're looking at more of a even stats fight, um, maybe a little less to worry about, but you get where I'm going with this. Anyway, I'll talk about this stuff all day. Uh, anyway, if you sat through all this rambling and ranting about comparative design and ergonomics and ballistics and whatever else, really thank you. Uh, this is stuff that seems to interest like only me because anytime I go on a rant about it, uh, people are like, yeah, man, that's cool, and then they change the subject, and I don't blame them. 
is interesting for those of us who like to nerd out on it. Everybody else, no, you know, not so much. Kind of like, ooh, it's a jet. It's loud. Cool, right? Anyway. Uh, yeah, thanks. Also, on a bit of a personal note, uh, I am going to be moving in about, about three days. Everything's going to be packed up and loaded into a truck, and we're moving back to the U.S. to warm, balmy Florida. So, uh, goodbye to Toronto. It's been great. Canada has been really good to us, but it's time to move home. And um, for that reason, I may not post any videos because to unpack all my stuff, I have to have a house to put it in, and I don't have that set up yet. So, it could be a few weeks. It could be a few months. You may not hear from me for a while. But, in case anybody cares, I'm still going to be doing voiceover work for um, the Harrier module. Uh, I'll be at Raven 1. I'll be playing the part as uh, of uh, Dutch. Uh, at least so far, that's what I'm doing. Uh, I'll be working on some other projects here and there. So you may hear my voice in DCS, but uh, my YouTube channel may be pretty quiet for a while. Anyway, seriously, if you're tuning into this, thanks. And I appreciate every view I get. I appreciate my comments. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's really rewarding to see somebody actually get some enjoyment out of my content here. So, so really, thanks. And uh, hope to see you again soon. Until then... Good hunting out there.